Carnegie Mellon Vaccination Database Talks are made possible by Autotune. Learn how to automatically optimize your MySQL and Postgres configurations at autotune.com. And by the Stephen Moy Foundation for keeping it real. Find out how best to keep it real at stephenmoyfoundation.org. Hello, Chris Jardis. Welcome to another uh, Vaccination Database Seminar Series. We're very excited today to have Dr. Barton Brennenbauer, a Bower. Uh, he is the VP Engineering at a semi-new database startup called Relational AI. They've kind of been in semi-stealth, and so now they're coming out talking about all the cool things that they're doing. So we're very excited for him being here. Um, so as always, if you have any questions for Martin, uh, please unmute yourself and say who you are and where you're coming from and ask your question at any time. And that way, Martin is not talking to himself uh, for an hour. We want this to be interactive. So Martin, thank you for, so much for being here. Go for it. All right. Thank you, Andy. Yeah, thanks for the invite, of course. It's uh, it's great here. Like, we are a big fan of the talks here at CMU. And so we're, we're happy to talk about Relation AI. Thanks, everybody, for joining as well. Uh, so like Andy said, I'm the VP of Engineering at Relation AI. So I will be presenting. But of course, uh, it's all work for my team. Um, and uh, it's a great team. We're very happy. Uh, and uh, um, and there's many of them on the call here as well. So uh, enjoy that, too. OK? All right, so what do we do? So Relation AI is building um, a database system for intelligent data apps. Um, now, let's unpack what that means. So intelligent data apps are typically built on the modern data stack, and they uh, include predictive and prescriptive analytics, which is machine learning optimization. So uh, we think uh, that intelligent data apps are best implemented on the relational knowledge graph. Um, and uh, there's really not a database system out there that you can use that is designed from the ground up to manage knowledge graphs at scale. And uh, that's what we work on. So let's first briefly talk about what the modern data stack is. The, um, so the modern data stack kind of captures the next step uh, after the, we, uh, the industry went to cloud computing. Like when it first moved, uh, there was a lot of infrastructure that was designed really to be on-premise and it just was moved to the cloud and it just happened to be run on the clouds, but it was not really architected for it. So systems like Postgres or Oracle or something like that. So in the last six, seven years, there's been a movement to um, get these systems to be cloud native and then uh, the cloud data platforms arrived, in particular, for example, Snowflake. Um, so large organizations, uh, they typically have hundreds to thousands of applications, and each application often has its own database uh, designed in an application-centric way. And you can imagine what the nightmare that becomes in terms of data governments um, in those companies. So the modern data stack uh, addresses that by bringing the data together from all these applications into a cloud data platform. And then you end up with the data of all the applications in one system. And now you can join across and manipulate uh, uh, the data across those applications. So uh, you can use the data in this cloud data, data platform to serve like BI, and data apps, ML workflows, and so on. Yeah. All right, so let's fill in some logos. So the data apps uh, on, on this stack uh, typically require you to go into something procedural or navigational, they are not using declarative technology like the cloud data platforms are, which are like Snowflake and Google BigQuery and Databricks and all that. Um, so the procedural ones are typically like either you use tensors because it's machine learning or it is navigational because you use a graph or this is procedural because there's nothing else available and they are not designed to be relational or cloud native. So uh, modern databases are uh, cloud native. Um, so database systems like BigQuery and Snowflake they essentially have infinite storage capacity uh, because they use the cloud as the storage layer. Um, they also have essentially infinite compute capacity because the compute can scale independently and you can provision however many CPUs you want. So these databases also support versioning, time travel, zero copy cloning. Uh, and that means that you can have workloads where on the one hand, you're maybe loading some data into the system while separately you're doing some exploratory, uh, exploratory analysis as a, as, a, uh, as a data scientist. And all these activities are isolated from each other, uh, which is very nice. Uh, so current graph database systems like Neo and Tiger Graph are not designed to be cloud native. They were originally designed to be on-premise and they don't uh, enjoy the elastic properties of the cloud. Um, so uh, in a general, essentially any system that was originally designed to be on-premise just has a harder time doing this because you need a lot of storage capacity to implement these kind of features. So, uh, as you'll see next, like we, we pair basically with a cloud data, data platform, and we don't really care which one that is. Um, like the capabilities among these systems are very similar. Uh, it's like Snowflake and Databricks and Redshift. Uh, it's a very competitive space. Uh, the opportunities of impact are somewhat limited, 
uh, they're fighting each other, they're benchmarking each other. Uh, and uh, as part of that, they're also clearly telling uh, um, what workloads they support and do not support. Yeah. Uh, so this picture is from the Snowflake homepage. And Snowflake indicates that you can use them for data engineering, uh, some elements of data science, and some elements of data apps. Yeah. All right, so they're also pretty clear about what they do not support. Um, so, for example, if you want to do graph analytics, then they typically encourage you to take your data elsewhere. Um, so, for example, they uh, would uh, point you at a uh, navigational graph system like near their attacking graph, um, or maybe even just start programming procedurally. Um, so, if you want to have, do any kind of reasoning, and we'll get into what we mean with reasoning later, uh, you basically have to leave and go into Java or Python, or maybe you would use a rule engine or something like that. Uh, but in any case, it is always external to the database engine. Um, if you want to do relational machine learning, we'll also get into what that is, um, or sometimes even any kind of machine learning, you also have to leave the, uh, the database paradigm and you go into things like TensorFlow or H2O and so on. And if you want to do mathematical optimization, uh, then again, you have to leave the cloud native environment. And every time you have to do that, you uh, don't enjoy all these compelling features like elasticity of storage and compute and all that, the versioning, data sharing, and workload isolation. So what we do is that we intend to complete the modern data stack in a way that you do not have to leave the environment anymore for these data app workloads. Uh, so the way that we do that is that we invented new algorithms and techniques that make it possible to support this kind of reasoning and graph analytics and optimization workloads relationally. And that's what much of the talk is going to be about, how we do that, OK? Um, so in this picture, um, the modern data stack becomes a larger box uh, that has the cloud data platform, like Snowflake and Databricks and all that, as well as a relational knowledge graph. Um, and uh, we bring these data apps that were not initially implemented to be cloud native and relational, we bring them into the modern data stack, and they uh, become declarative. So it's kind of an interesting uh, movement going on, at least I really enjoy this, is that uh, all kinds of people are starting to realize that, uh, of course, that all the data that you're bringing together in the one database management system is still kind of difficult to work with. Like it's physically in one place, uh, but it still it needs to be integrated and used together. And so uh, the way that people are addressing this is that uh, people are talking about building a semantic layer um, so that they can manage the complexities of all these uh, different schemas. And a uh, primary one is DBT. They've also given a talk here. Um, and the semantic layer, that basically lets you define concepts and relationships that over arts all these various data sets. Um, and then you talk with a semantic layer instead of with a low-level database. And um, I'm very excited about this because like tools like DBT and what they're trying to do at the semantic level is really uh, stuff that databases have never been extraordinarily good at. And so I think this will really push uh, what databases will, uh, will, will be asked to do, basically. And that's always good. Um, so this is also, incidentally, exactly what Legend does. Uh, now, so Legend was originally developed by Goldman Sachs, and it was recently open sourced. And it is also addressing the exact same data governance issues um, as a platform for data apps. And what's kind of interesting is that uh, I understood that they actually have 20,000 users internally at Goldman uh, using and building data apps on Legend. So that's kind of huge. Um, and uh, to give you an impression of what it is, uh, because like all these words, they might uh, uh, <laughs> give you the wrong impression of what it is. It actually, uh, it's, an, uh, it's a textual language. Um, it's a beautiful modeling language. Uh, the, here's a Legend model uh, with concepts like person and firm and big firm. And you're basically able to derive what a big firm is with some declarative query there. Um, and this is how users define concepts and relationships, which is very reminiscent of what DPT and also LucaML do. Yeah? So if you look overall at the landscape, then you see tools arising like uh, DPT and LucaML and Legend and Micro Power Apps to some degree. And they're all trying to serve this data apps market of like apps that do something more intelligent with the data sitting in the, in the cloud, uh, cloud data warehouses. And um, so we think that it's really important that uh, data apps are going to be relational. Um, that they're going to be declarative, uh, it needs to be an expressive language, you'll see why, um, and that uh, it needs to be based on executable models. Yeah. All right, so before we dive in, I need to briefly show uh, how we uh, use the relational model, because it's a little, uh, it's, it's subtly different from what we maybe are used to. So to start very basic, let's just take a look at a simple graph. This is just a normal graph with binary edges. Um, and um, every edge in this graph becomes an uh, uh, tuple in the relation. We name the relation edge in this case. 
And so, for example, you see there's an ads from three to two. So you see here like an ads three to, yeah, okay. Um, all right, so let's, so let's take a look at label property graphs as you can find them in Neo4j and Neptune, for example. Um, they can perfectly fine be represented as relations as well. So properties of nodes are binary relations. So for example, uh, fill enough, uh, the director is a binary relation here that uh, the, the person with identity two has, has the name fill enough, yeah? Um, the uh, uh, labels are unit relations, like let's say a director is, for example, this here, yeah? and actor is there. Um, and um, uh, the edges, like directed and actor, they become binary relations. So let's say there is a relation from one to three there, yeah, one to three. Um, and you see that uh, label property graphs also allow properties on nodes, like this, which is here with the role that um, uh, Chalamet played. And he played. Um, in movie, uh, actor one in movie three uh, played the role of uh, Paul Trace. Yeah. Okay, so that is uh, label property graphs as relations. Um, so, okay, so let's take a look at tables. <laughs> the, um, so, uh, if I would ask you to take this table here um, and make a graph out of it, then I would guess you come up with something like this probably. Right? So, you make uh, this the primary key, so you make a note out of that, uh, order one and order two and you link it uh, with access to the different things that come up, yeah? Um, so um, if you map that back to the pictures that I just was showing you, then you basically get this, right? So you have a customer, um, the customer of order one is 500, the customer of order two is 23, uh, the date of order one and two is this, and the price is 75 and 43, yeah? So uh, this is exactly how we model SQL tables. Um, we try to model them more graph-like, and in a sense, uh, the way that we see SQL tables, it's kind of like a modularity construct, really, um, is that it groups a bunch of relations together that share the same primary key. Yeah, okay. Um, all right, uh, now uh, let's go to, uh, to vectors and tensors. So uh, vectors can be modeled as relations as well. Um, so the first argument is the, uh, in this example, is the index one, two, three. Um, and the second is the value for one, eight. Um, and similarly, matrices are ternary relations. So you have two indexes now, right? One, one, minus one, three, and all that. And um, so what it really highlights is that the, the, the relational model is very universal, actually, right? You can virtually model anything in it. Um, and um, this basically leaves the challenge is that, okay, like it, of course, it does need to efficiently be implemented, right? So the, the logic is not the problem necessarily. The implementation is maybe a challenge, yeah? Okay. Um, so matrix multiplication um, on these tensors is very easy to define, actually, in, uh, uh, in relational systems. So uh, this is matrix mul multiplication. You're computing these cells there. Uh, so this is the math expression there that you see. Um, in SQL, you have to define it like this. Um, in, uh, so we are designing a language called RHEL, which is our uh, new relational language. It's very close to tensors, so it looks a little bit more compact. This is not to show that RHEL is better than SQL. It's just like the design bias of RHEL is more in this direction. That's why it looks so nice. Yeah? Um, so basically, it's almost a direct syntactical mapping to the mathematical tensor notation, right? Um, and uh, uh, hopefully that's clear, yeah? The, um, now, so um, if you do this for sparse matrices, uh, actually our performance results on this are actually quite good. Uh, but if you do it for dense matrices, then it's not so amazing. And, uh, but then the challenge I think to the relational systems is that it's, it's data independence, right? So the logic is independent from the system implementation and they should innovate to implement these uh, dense uh, tensors uh, efficiently. Which is exactly called points. Right. Sorry, yeah. quick question. Like the, the, the rel programming language that's what you that's what you, you would expose to a, a somebody that was using relational AI or this is something that you guys maintain internally and there's a higher level level language above this yeah both so we do expose the language so you can create the system in this language it compiles into an IR uh, but we also have uh, projects ongoing where we layer other things on top of rel uh, because we're not like we're more like the generality and the model of rel than necessarily that we're married to the syntax. Um, so uh, boats basically. Yeah. And so like the rel, that the, that's the level that you guys then reason about before you go to the IR. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah, yes. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Um, all right. So like I said, so this is basically the original point of the of Colt. Uh, Colt is of course uh, uh, responsible for much of the relational model. Uh, this is a beautiful paragraph uh, right into the paper where he says that uh, he thinks that this should yield maximal independence between program on the one hand and machine representations and organizational data on the other. So that's the goal, right? I, I think that's a great goal. 
And um, I think uh, uh, it's good to keep challenging that and see how far we can push that, okay? All right, so uh, let's talk a little bit about reasoning. I need to explain what, how we see reasoning and, and, uh, uh, and what that means. So, um, so it's not a very widely used term. So let's first take a look at a very familiar example, at least uh, uh, to people from the SQL database community. Um, it is, imagine that you want to develop, in, develop an intelligent data app uh, for an order database, like it could be DPCH or it could be Norbit or something like that. And you may want to include some analytical features like maybe tracking a metric for the average charts on users or something like that. Now it's kind of interesting, like this is actually where the problem already starts because the TPCH schema does not actually define charts. It's only used as a term in the description of the queries. Um, and it's not actually like a, a formally defined concept otherwise. Now, it's kind of interesting that the order table does actually have a total price, which turns out is actually the charts if you sum up the, the, the charts from the, from the line items. Uh, so it's kind of a computed column that is sitting in the order table that you could actually compute otherwise, um, which I think belongs in the semantic layer. That's the point where we're driving at. Um, so uh, this is a pretty common issue. Like we see this all the time, that data comes in that is partially computed and then you have to go figure out the inconsistencies and all that and what's actually real data and what is not real data. It's a very common issue. Um, and uh, I, I enjoy it kind of that even TPCH, like the most simple benchmark that you can possibly pick on the schema size that already exposes like real issues in here. Um, yeah. The, um, uh, so, and in particular, like let's say, if, you have an, if you're trying to design a system and you actually don't define these terms somewhere, there's no way that you can nicely build some BI tool or use something that, um, uh, that actually uses that terminology, right? Okay, so let, let's just go define these concepts and relations. Um, so these are the rel definitions, again, uh, for, I'm gonna not actually explain the syntax much, I'm just gonna assume that you understand it, which I hope is true, <laughs> otherwise let us know. Um, the, uh, and so we're defining this concept for charts and being late and for revenue, um, and they are defined for, in this case, for orders as well as line as well as line items. So this is the line item one, this order one. Yeah. Um, so um, uh, so these definitions can also be kind of understood if you think of this as a graph again. Yeah. So like we go back to the table discussion in the model. You can kind of think of these definitions as introducing new edges and node labels. Like maybe this purple one is, for example, could be these are the late orders. Let's say. Yeah. Okay. Um, all right, and these definitions, they form a dependency graph. This one is a simple one, but this dependencies. And this is very similar to what you see in DBT or Legend or LookML, yeah, okay? Um, all right, so this knowledge that we have just defined, it's a really plain active role in the semantic layer to form this relational knowledge graph. And it needs to be accurate and up-to-date. So let's say if the underlying graph changes, like let's say an edge gets inserted, that might have completely different effects on the knowledge that is defined. And so you would expect it to be propagated. Like for example, maybe this edge is no longer there and goes away and the other one becomes purple. Yeah, okay. All right, so this is basically what we do. And we do this at very large scale. Um, so uh, like applications uh, for our current relational AI customers have thousands of derived relationships defined. Um, the dependencies of logic are complicated. Uh, there's a foundation of the system in data log. Uh, this is basically the underlying IR somewhere. And we support mutual dependencies between these uh, relationships. Um, and uh, we use recursive evaluation methods for that. Uh, the recursion also allows uh, general aggregation and negation, which is very important because almost anything in a graph uses aggregation. <laughs> yeah. Um, all right, so to kind of, I can't really uh, illustrate the complexity of the logic RL. First of all, the logic is confidential for our customers. And second, uh, it puts to be too much. So we decided to make to make a dependency graph for the application logic of our customers. Um, so this application in text analysis, uh, this is uh, not the actual data in the application. This is the code, okay? This is the dependency graph of the code. And these are all, every uh, dot is a node that is a relation and the edges are the dependencies between the relations. Uh, so clearly this is kind of large. Uh, as a user, you don't have to understand this. It's more to understand, uh, uh, to explain the sheer size of the thing. Uh, then this is something that you need to comprehend, yeah? Um, and this, by the way, like this application, like it places uh, for this customer a few million lines of procedural code that they were writing. Uh, so those big, it is much smaller than what they originally were imagining. Uh, so this is also kind of a cool example. So zooming in on the previous graph, uh, you'll find all kinds of strongly connected components which are recursive, right? Uh, so here you see a strongly connected components and every node in this graph is the definition, a view definition, and they're all recursively dependent on each other. Yeah. 
And then you have really dense nodes as well. So this is one node in the graph. So there's a crazy number of outgoing answers. I don't know what it is actually. Uh, we just found it in the dependency graph. And so this really shows like the machinery that you need to evaluate as well. Um, uh, like even at the data level, some graph systems would not actually support these kind of dense nodes very well, uh, let, uh, let alone at the code level. Yeah. All right. So if you have these ginormous models, then eagerly maintaining the model is not a good idea. Like if you have uh, like a few thousand relations, uh, if anytime you update, you go check if everything needs to update, that's not, not a good idea. Um, so relation AI is entirely demand driven. Um, so computations happen only when they are needed. Uh, so the, the, the user asks for something, let's say, and it triggers computations in the graph. And the architecture for this is really cool. It's based actually on programming language research uh, for compilers. Uh, that are designed to be used in IDEs. There has been a progression in compiler construction from batch uh, to responsive incremental compilers that uh, while you're typing, uh, recompute their stuff in the ID, which is exactly what a database also needs. And so that's what we use. It's kind of like a build system. So there is uh, dependency tracking, memorization, cache invalidation, all kind of stuff happening. Um, so the framework that we use for this uh, is uh, called Salsa. We open source this so you can use it. Um, and uh, there are a couple of talks about it. Like one is actually not from us, it's from the Rust predecessor of Salsa. It's a great talk, I would highly recommend it. The other one is uh, by our team members, uh, Nathan, yeah? Um, and also in the line, yeah, go ahead. I think at a high level, like this is, like this incrementality and like sort of this approach, this is facilitated because of things like DBT or Ledger, where now instead of like getting one-off ad hoc queries in Tableau, people are telling you, declaring ahead of time, like what exactly they want. And therefore you can take advantage of that and compile stuff. Yeah, 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 yeah. All right, we have a question in chat. If they, if they, Aaron, if you want to unmute yourself. Yeah, so I, yeah, you mentioned that it's demand driven. So how are you deciding when you should cache values versus it's cheaper to just recalculate things each time you need them? Right, right. So the caching decisions is currently uh, by the, by us, let's say, so we decide at the code level what is cached. Uh, so we know the system, let's say, we pick that. We could make the wrong decisions, of course. Um, and then um, uh, we do have profiles for this as well, so that can help us understand the overall performance. Um, and uh, the way that we envision this is that basically, like in print, it's kind of like deferred view maintenance, if it rings a bell, right? So like, let's say you can, the views could be deferred, let's say in the, in the, in the background, outside of transactions, we can start uh, updating everything already and preparing for future transactions that may happen. And you could even imagine in a really crazy scenario that we start using machine learning to predict what people are gonna ask for at what point in time and actually bring those views up, up to date and all that. But like architecturally, what we catch is in our codes is we, we make the decisions right now, but it would be interesting to do it differently. Um, yeah. yeah? Pete has a question. I got a question. Can you hear me? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So really two questions. So one is that I looked at your declaration of the, the data. It looks very similar to RDF. Am I wrong over there? No, you're not. Um, so like uh, it's similar, but also different. So RDF does triples, right? And only triples. Uh, we do arbitrary error tree relations. So you can do one, two, three, four, five, and so on. Um, that's a little bit more flexible. So let's say if you have temporal data in particular, that is much easier to model in our system than in the, in the RDF. It is also somewhat similar though, in the sense that RDF uh, allows you to have very convenient uh, schema level queries. Like you can do generic queries over the RDF graph and we support that as well. So there are some kind of conceptual similarities, um, but uh, we are slightly more general in the data model. Okay, so then you showed you showed the matrix uh, data type. So are you really using this data model for matrices? Uh, at the application logic level, yes. Yeah, so that was the point I was trying to make is that like, let's say if we go back here, like if you look at this, like it's certainly not convenient like the way it's written here, um, but there is no redundant information in there. Like you really need all of this to some degree, right? Uh, maybe you might want to know that there's no index missing or something like that, but this is really it. And so the, now this is not necessarily how you want to implement it. So you might want to have like dense data structures in your runtime to actually support this effectively. Um, but yes, we are trying to do that. Yes, that's, that's the AI in relation to AI. <laughs> yeah. okay, so then if you compare it with the system like system ML that really focused on this one, and it does have optimized and all that because it's declarative. Do you think that you guys can beat that or? 
I don't know. Like, I've never used SystemL nor benchmarked against it. I've read about it. I know a little bit about it, but not too much. I don't really want to say too much about it. Uh, but like, we are more more general system probably in the sense that we also try to support other workloads. Uh, so I I imagine that SystemL could probably do a better job than we do <laughs> because they're specialized, right? Yeah, so, that's yeah, the point yeah. because you're yeah. you're talking about high scale and very efficient computation with the automatic optimization like relational. So that's what SystemML does. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. I'm sure it's a great system. The uh, like the uh, we just we also try to do other workloads. Um, the uh, so yeah. Okay, thank you. Yeah. All right. Um, where was I? I was here. Uh, incrementality. Okay. Um, all right. Okay. So briefly to summarize the reasoning stuff and how we position ourselves, or at least what our vision is, is that from our perspective, like reasoning really subsumes um, uh, and captures basically application logic that is currently still written procedurally in languages like Python and Java. Um, yeah. um, so we've all been conditioned to build our applications in the split brain architecture. Um, and uh, part of the application is defined in the database, usually a SQL database. And then the rest of the application is written client side in Java or C Sharp or something. Um, and what the app is trying to do is completely not in one place and there's no good overview. Um, and so you cannot optimize across those parts. And the database like doesn't really understand what's happening. It's like, that's the doc picture. Like it's like blah 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 blah. Read this. Let's say right. Um, and um, uh, so we think it's uh, it's about time uh, that the app logic is actually expressed relationally and that it's executed by a database. Um, so bringing the app logic to the database uh, makes it possible for one system to manage the semantics, the integrity, and the resources that the application needs. Um, so we've been working towards this kind of solution already also before relational AI already, um, and it's getting more and more um, successful, I think. And so in particular, in the latest iterations, like we have seen um, uh, that some of our applications get like a 10 to 100 times um, reduction in complexity in, their, in the code bases. So, yeah. All right, okay, so let's get a little bit more technical. We're gonna dive into uh, object storage and how we store data, um, okay? All right, so this is the high level picture. The high level storage management is very similar to other cloud data systems. This is not intended to be surprising in any way. Um, so we use cloud object storage for durable storage um, here. Um, and we use ephemeral disks and uh, RAM for, uh, for caching. Uh, we support workloads that are larger than memory as well as larger than disk. And then we just effect, effect to the uh, object storage and handle it uh, and then might load it later. So the way we kind of are in blend of, let's say, Snowflake-like IDs and Umbra Link Store IDs. Umbra Link Store is a system that is designed to have in-memory performance while still performing out of core. And we try very hard to be at that level. So now, uh, so write databases are immutable, um, uh, which means that data has never changed in place, right? Um, but the key difference with other systems is that actually the entire database is immutable, including the catalog, and it is versioned in the same way. Um, so if you look at Iceberg or Snowflake, then they version um, individual tables, but they don't version the overall, the overall catalog itself in the, in the, in the same way. Um, so in this picture, what you see here is that um, you see here a catalog, this is what this thing is supposed to show, with some B3s uh, for relation A, B, and C. And there is an, uh, an highly available key value store that we use with a strong consistency that has a uh, pointer to the root of the database. Okay. Um, and the database called demo. Um, so now if we execute a transaction, transaction C, and it, it changes something in C, uh, then uh, we're gonna, uh, of course, we need to assert that into C, but C is an immutable data structure. It is right optimized though. And that is why the changes of C land in some buffer that is somewhere in the B3. We use B epsilon trees. Uh, there, there are papers written about that. They're pretty good. Um, and, um, um, what happens is also that in the key value store, the root pointer for this uh, database now points into here, okay? So note, of course, that the previous database is not modified um, and uh, read-only transactions that were running on that database can just continue without any concern, really. It still exists entirely as is, um, okay? All right, so now next, maybe the user decided to take a snapshot of the current database and keep that version around under some other name, right? It created that thing. Uh, so in our system, this is strictly an O1 operation because the only thing you're copying is the pointer. Um, and it supports like concurrent schema changes in full generality. It's very important to us because knowledge graphs are very, uh, 
uh, dynamic, uh, little schema changes are happening. And so this needs to be supported really well. Um, so if the previous database is no longer used, then at some point it may be garbage collected. Um, and um, a data that was only involved for that database that's no longer reachable will, will become deleted. Uh, so that's why you saw that the C gone, right? But A and B is still there. That is because that is still reachable, okay? Um, all right, and then another transaction happens on demo that points to the new thing. And of course, the snapshot still points to the previous version, okay? All right, so um, while immutable tables are pretty common, um, uh, the key distinction is here that I, our entire catalog is immutable in versions. And uh, this level of immutability basically trivially supports uh, strict serializability. Uh, we think that is critical for data apps. Uh, there has been some research on that in particular by Peter Bellis, who has, uh, um, who has been looking into isolation levels and potential violations and problems that arise with a split brain setting. Um, and we think it's very important to keep that, uh, that isolation level. So read workloads do not need to acquire locks because the data is immutable. So why would you lock anything? And uh, there's also no coordination whatsoever needed with any other uh, engine that may be running. Um, and so we scale really well for, for read workloads. You can basically spin up however many CPUs you want and do read-only workloads on it. Um, like I already said, cloning is a true a one operation. That's great. Um, and, um, and then and so next is that the, uh, so we'll get back to this, why this is, but our entire database is indexed, uh, which makes it really important to have right optimized data structures uh, because uh, index basically means all your data is sorted. And if you have random insertions on an entirely sorted database that would perform very, very poorly, in particular in a cloud object storage setting. Uh, so we use immutable, right optimized data structures on cloud object storage. This is a really good fit uh, because write optimization limits how much is going to be written to object storage. Uh, and cloud object storage, you kind of don't really want to mutate anyway. Um, and so this is actually a very good combination, we think. Um, and uh, uh, also, we don't have a transaction log um, because uh, the, uh, every, every write transaction creates a new pointer to a new, a new database. Um, and that is uh, atomically updated in the key value store. And anything that goes wrong before that is just, it doesn't matter. Like nothing got changed basically. So there's no need for a transaction log and uh, procedures for uh, undoing stuff or whatever. Yeah. All right, um, so um, here are some papers that influence our thinking. Hopefully this is a recording and if you're interested, then you can read more about uh, exactly what we, uh, what we do there, yeah. All right, so the next section is on join algorithms. Uh, <laughs> that is uh, the, probably uh, one of the exciting ones. Um, so the, because uh, th this is where things are pretty different. So currently, uh, most SQL systems, they use binary join algorithms. Uh, there are some variations, but generally, let's say they use binary joins. Um, and um, uh, they basically join two tables at a time. Now, if you're in a knowledge graph application, and then you're often joining many relations, um, and often the intermediate results are very large if you join only two at a time. Um, so this is a triangle query, uh, you see here. So this is a triangle graph pattern that illustrates that a uh, director has a child uh, who acted in the same movie as he directed. So kind of trying to find conflicts of interest or something maybe. Um, and if you look at what the options are, is that any binary plan here is just, is just too large. Like there's no combination of these edges uh, that is reasonably small. Like all directors have children, mostly probably. Uh, every director has movie, every movie has directors and actors and every actor has parents. So there's really no two that you can pick that actually has a reasonably small result, yeah? Um, now, I think this is maybe one of the reasons why uh, practitioners often complain that joints are bad or you shouldn't use joints or whatever, which I, of course, don't like at all. Um, the, uh, is that uh, uh, there are multiple reasons for it, but this may be one, yeah? So, the, so we use this thing called worst case optimal joint algorithms. So it's a new class of uh, algorithms uh, whose properties are, uh, we're still kind of even figuring out ourselves probably. Uh, like we kind of just keep discovering new interesting insights of what you can do with these algorithms uh, that are very interesting. So I'm actually gonna show it from a few angles, which hopefully will make it more clear what the point is of first optimal joints. Uh, so the first angle is sparsity. I think that's usually how it is shown. Uh, the second is, uh, uh, we're gonna look at subqueries, correlated subqueries. And then the third is index selection. All right, so first sparsity. I'm gonna not spend too much time on this because I'm, otherwise I'm gonna get to other interesting parts. 
But basically, uh, virtually optimal joins, they use sparsity on all relations that you're joining at the same time uh, to narrow down the search. So if you're looking for a female Asian director and Oscar winner, then there is exactly one who happened to have win an Oscar last year. Um, and uh, uh, given that some of these have interesting different sparsity patterns, you can very quickly with this algorithm find the, that person, yeah? Uh, so in particular, like let's say here in this area, let's like these are supposed to be tuples here, that's the ID. And then uh, these are the relations and uh, uh, the dots are the present facts, yeah? Um, so uh, in this area, there's no Oscar winner. So that's why it immediately jumps here. Uh, and then there's no director here, which is why it immediately jumps further. Yeah. Um, so um, I, this is pretty well documented in papers. And then this property of, of uh, virtual mode join algorithms is pretty well understood, I think. Yeah. Okay, so now let's move on though, because uh, what's interesting here is that uh, for the unary case, like virtual optimal joints are essentially similar to merge ones. So this doesn't seem very new at the unary level. Um, the interesting innovation though, is that this uh, kind of narrowing down of the search is done continuously at every level. Um, yeah? And so to go back to the triangle example, like let's say that we, uh, you have to pick a variable ordering in these algorithms. So let's say that we start with the director and then the actor and then uh, the movie. So let's say that you first go start looking for, for, for director Ds, yeah? um, then um, you're gonna join a child and um, directed, but we're not yet looking for um, specific uh, actors and movies. We're only joining on the D. Yeah? So we're gonna look for um, um, uh, directors who have directed some movie and have some child. That's basically what we're searching for. Yeah? That's actually a fairly efficient query because that's a subset of all, of all directors, which is not that huge, right? Uh, so now we have a D, we have a D, okay? Uh, we uh, will move to find children A who acted in some movie. Uh, now A occurs in the child relationship as well as in the active in relationship, right? Um, and um, uh, that's interesting because it's actually fairly narrow because now an, you need to have an, uh, you need to have a director uh, that has a child and that child acted in a movie. Uh, that's probably not the most common thing ever. There are probably some, but it's not like a uh, multi-billion population. Um, and so that's going pretty well. Um, and uh, finally then at the last step, we, we take the M's and then we kind of narrow it down further and we uh, find uh, only the, the ones that have a conflict of interest, let's say, yeah? All right, so that's sort of how this plays. Okay, now, um, while I was explaining this, you might already have gotten an idea that it actually looks kind of similar to correlated subqueries, right? Like, because once you have a D and then you're gonna do a lot of stuff that is kind of like a subquery, right? Um, and which is exactly the case. Um, so in risk ultimate joins, basically every next variable that you're joining on kind of acts like a correlated subquery. Um, and um, so here's an example, just so that everybody can follow it, is that this is a SQL correlated subquery. It's a query within a query. Um, it is counting the post of users in a certain country. Um, and um, uh, they, uh, um, you can't count it without knowing the users, let's say, yeah. Um, and so uh, the, um, like you can evaluate this in various ways. Like the best thing to do in SQL systems is to decorrelate it. You actually analyze this very hard and then you find a way to execute it, which is not a nested subquery. Basically, that's sort of what you're, what you're supposed to do. And that's trying to avoid a nested loop on. A nested loop on is where you go over the outer query and for every tuple, you go into the inner query. Uh, that is typically expensive. Um, so uh, you could also like first evaluate the subquery and then maybe overcalculate. Uh, that's also very risky, of course, okay? Now, so in relation I, we use two uh, complementary methods to handle this. Um, so one is, um, uh, is that we, if the subquery is not correlated, we use a completely different part of the system. It's the semantic optimizer, and it will already optimize that away and do something entirely different for it. So let's just ignore that. Uh, so for the correlated queries, it's really interesting because virtual optimal joins are really a correlated, correlated join device. That's how I like to think about it, yeah? Uh, so they are good at correlated queries. Um, and I'll start explaining a little bit why that is, yeah? Um, uh, but basically like, well, the next point is that um, uh, they're not only correlated joint devices, they're also indexing devices and together that is a great solution for correlated subqueries. So let's go into the indexing because that combined with the other thing explains it, yeah? Um, 
So for SQL systems, and well, many other systems, of course, not necessarily SQL only, is that selecting the right indexes is a very hard problem. It's not really solved. Uh, it's hard for users. You need to understand your workload. Uh, Auto tuning tools exist, uh, but they usually play an advisory role, and then you still need to make your own uh, decisions. Um, but at our scale, like with this graph that I just showed you, like there's no way that our users are meant to become select indexes, right? So it's just not going to work. So we need something different, more robust to writing large quantities of logic. Um, and so um, the way that we recast the problem is that we uh, automatically create an index on every relation in the system. That's why I said earlier that the database is entirely indexed. Um, and because the schemas are graph-like, um, even if they actually represent tables, right? The relations are very narrow. They're right? typically only like arity one to three or something like that, uh, which is like an RDF triple, right? And, and RDF triples, they do the same thing actually in RDF systems. They typically index the entire database for the combinations of the triple. Um, so given these indexes, a result join is essentially a device to make an arbitrary composite index. So we make all these little building blocks indexes and then on top of that, you can make any composite index. And that is, of course, very powerful, yeah, okay? So that's exactly why virtual multiple joins do so good at graph patterns, because that's exactly what graph patterns are typically, right? You have some things, some properties, or nodes that you're selecting, uh, which exactly meets these, these criteria. So as an example, to understand this, is um, uh, this is a graph, it's some information on cars. You have two cars, one is a Jeep, and one is a Ford, and an Escape, and a Cherokee, right? Um, so given this schema, uh, uh, relation I would make these brand indexes and model indexes. There's two of those per, per item, right? Um, and those are the building blocks for the composite indexes. Uh, and then all these other indexes, they're created on the fly for free when necessary. Um, and uh, there exists for all the combinations of the properties. And uh, this is not an overwhelming picture in how many of these indexes there are, but add one or two more kinds of properties and it will explode with the number of options that exist that are all indexes that are freely available to the uh, query evaluator. Yeah. All right, so I think that's a key point of risk optimal joints. Um, the, now, how do we implement all this stuff? Um, so uh, this is the, the classic story about query evaluators. There are kind of uh, three variations that you can do. You can do a classic tuple at a time interpreter uh, which is uh, low latency, but has high over per tuple. You can do a compiler, which is high latency and uh, not, uh, sorry, high latency and good performance per tuple, right? Uh, and then you can do a vectorized interpreter, which amortizes the cost of the, uh, of the interpretation. And that has the, the sort of the best of both worlds. Now, these are amazing. However, uh, nobody has yet figured out how to vectorize and virtual optimal join. Uh, so uh, there are people working on it, but it's not yet successful. Um, so what we do is that we have a compiler and a factorized interpreter, and they work together. Uh, they're implemented in this language called Julia, uh, which is an interesting language because it's very high level, but also allows for system programming. And uh, this kind of helps with the maintenance concerns that typically exist when you have these multiple backends, because Julia is very good at compiling and inlining and optimizing stuff. And so we can implement this at a fairly high level and actually share much of the infrastructure that is behind these, uh, these stacks. Yeah. And what's interesting is that we have designed this that actually these can be embedded. So the compiler can actually be invoked from within the vectorized interpreter. And so you can actually have a query plan that on the outermost is, um, um, is, an, uh, is a vectorized query, but innermost solves some virtual to joint parts, basically. Yeah. All right, now there's one more innovation. I, I think Aaron's got a question about the Julia stuff. Go ask now. Do you end up with an explosion of types because the Julia compiler is trying to like compile a new type for every schema you could possibly get? And right, all right. Blow clearly. out your iCache all the time. <laughs> yeah, clearly, you know, Julia. Yeah. The, uh, so we, uh, so, um, so Julia is, uh, so we, we, we exploit this, of course, to some degree, like we want this, like we actually exploit the type system. However, uh, we also like compile it in bits and pieces that actually does reuse a lot of functionality. So most of the queries, um, uh, they, they um, well, I'm not sure what numbers you're looking for, but like it's not excessive. Uh, it's not a C++ compiler, let's say, right? There are systems that simply invoke a C++ compiler that has a very low latency experience. Uh, this is significantly better um, because of compiling bits and pieces together. So, yeah. Okay. Um, all right, so one more innovation here. Oh, I'm really running bad on time. Um, 
the um, uh, that is the Dovetail Drone Compiler. So this is not yet published. We really would like to write a paper about this. Is that um, so? Dovetail Join is a new uh, algorithm that we invented. So uh, based on our experience with virtual optimal joints, um, we found out that uh, uh, the first generation of algorithms they were really designed with interpretation in mind, and therefore they had some runtime bookkeeping that had to be kept. Um, and that costs something. Um, so Dovetail Join is a variation of these algorithms that is specifically designed for, comp for compilation and compiles this overhead into the actual code. So it a, it's a, it uses a state machine approach and it is very fast. Um, and uh, we're very eager to, uh, to start uh, talking about it more. Yeah, I don't have too much details on this otherwise. Uh, all right, here's some papers. I'm gonna swiftly move on. Um, to semantic optimization. Um, so um, semantic optimization is uh, is, the, is, a, is a high level op optimizer. As a, uh, and uh, the idea is very simple. Let's say you have a RHEL model and RHEL application logic, you have some knowledge, I'll show you what that is. It goes into the semantic optimizer um, and the optimized model comes out and it can answer faster, yeah? The, uh, the kind of knowledge that we specifically exploit here is, uh, is axioms. Um, axioms on, let's say, the combinations of plus and multiplication, uh, minus and plus and so on. Yeah? I'll show examples. Um, so let's say if you take a min aggregation of an F and a G, and I and G, J are independent, uh, then uh, we, with our semantic and algebraic properties, can include that these are independent, and you can separately do min F plus min G. Yeah? Now, if you do a min of uh, f and g where there is a dependency, actually, then this is not valid because it has to, say, has to be the same i, right? You can't split them out and then do the lowest. That's not, that's not correct. So this cannot be optimized in this way. There's a dependency. Um, and then this is the count example. If you count the Cartesian product, then, um, of course, intuitively, it's probably clear that you can count the individual ones and then multiply them. It's very surprising. It's still, SQL systems still often do not do this. And I, I still find it hard to understand why not. <laughs> the, uh, but, yeah. Yeah. Um, all right, so now you might think maybe at first glance, you might say, oh, well, okay, cool, but seems very syntactic. I can do that too, right? Um, the, uh, it is actually fairly deep. Like we really understand the semantics of the logic. So there's an example here where I slightly refine this, uh, this count of, uh, of three independent relations. I put a little bit of a condition on it that kind of relates them, let's say, right? You can't just do something simple here anymore. It still actually understands the structure of this problem and decomposes it into uh, an AB uh, problem and a BC problem and then multiplies the two and sums them up, yeah? Um, so it really understands your, your math and optimizes it accordingly, okay? Uh, it goes even further in that um, if you have uh, recursive definitions, we can push aggregations into it as well. So this is an, uh, an, an path, uh, a path recursive definition for computing the length of a path. Uh, this computes all the paths in a graph, which are of course many potentially, uh, could be infinite if it's cyclic. Uh, and uh, then only at the very end, we say, oh, I wanna have the shortest. Um, and you're gonna take the min aggregation for that. Um, so our optimizer understands the algebraic properties to the degree that it can actually push the min aggregation into the recursion um, it now is in the shortest path computation and it will only compute the shortest path. And to some degree, that's actually Dijkstra's algorithm. So we just wrote an algorithm inventor here, basically, which is kind of cool, yeah. Um, now this goes further is that like this example that I have here, this is actually an old pair shortest path and that is very nice, but it doesn't scale. Uh, the, uh, if you have uh, a graph of a million nodes, there are a lot of pairs. <laughs> so that's not a good idea. Um, so typically, you actually want to have a more specific uh, path, yeah? Uh, so we support that too. We support it with the mount transformation. Uh, the, the example that we use here is Kevin Bacon, degrees of Kevin Bacon. Uh, he's plays in many movies, and this is the degree of Kevin Bacon of how far away are you from him? Uh, and so what happens here is that you invoke shortest path, you ask in the outcome only for Kevin Bacon, and our system is able to specialize uh, the computation to the shortest path now to even include the fact that we only want to start with Kevin Bacon, basically. Yeah, that's what you see there. Um, uh, let me skip this one. Uh, there's more interesting things coming up. Uh, cool papers. Um, uh, we have another paper this year, uh, which won the best paper award. Uh, this is particularly on uh, recursion computations, very interesting. Um, all right, so the language. Um, the, uh, the language is called RHEL. I'm not gonna explain the structure of language, but I wanna explain some of the design ideas and why we created it. 
Um, so in our past, uh, we worked with, with uh, Datalog, and Datalog is great, but it's also very first order. Um, and so it does not support abstraction in any way. Um, and uh, we realized that we want to scale up what, what, what is necessary for the semantic layer. Like we need to have generic algorithms. We want to have uh, libraries and reusable code and all that. And uh, uh, we needed to, to design a language for that. So we want to have abstractions for statistics. Let's say that in the language, you can define standard deviation, for example, and it just figures out how to compute that efficiently. Um, we want to also abstract over schema. So let's say if you want to do machine learning applications, then, then our data frames, let's say. Data frames is really a collection of relations, and we want to do generic stuff over that. Um, and, uh, and then we want the whole thing to be live and very easy. Let's say if you have a JSON file, you want to be, uh, import it and just not have to worry about declaring a schema, let's say, okay? All right, so the, um, just some quick examples, like uh, from the st standard library, uh, there, there's a file with like 6,000 lines of logic uh, that uh, defines all these abstractions. So there's relation algebra abstractions, uh, statistics stuff, and algebraic properties. I'll move on, yeah, because there's two more interesting stuff later. This is the graph analytics, uh, graph analytics library. Um, so this is generically defined as a library that you just can instantiate from your application, it's not a template. Uh, you don't have to copy it or whatever. You don't have to change it. Um, and uh, uh, you give it a graph um, and you get all your typical graph algorithms. This is, of course, a subset of what there actually will be in there. Yeah. Um, and then uh, I really like this one. Um, so like I mentioned, this data frame uh, features example is like features is really a set, of, a set of relations. And it's really interesting to see data scientists work and see what their needs are in their workflow. Uh, they really want to see all the statistics about all the relations in their data frame. That is what the scribe does. Yeah? There's no SQL system that really does that, where you give it a whole bunch of tables and it gives you statistics about it. Um, so uh, RHEL supports that kind of abstraction. So you can describe is actually defined in the language, in, in the library. It does some metaprogramming over uh, the parameters that come in and then generates all the right aggregations for you. And that's exactly what's happening here. So this is the uh, penguin set. Um, and so you get all these statistics, uh, like uh, apparently uh, there are more male than females in this. Um, and uh, uh, they're all on the island Pisco. <laughs> yeah. um, okay. Um, all right, we also have integrity constraints. They're very powerful, but I want to share other stuff, so I'm going to move on. Uh, we also have incremental computation. Um, I'm also going to go over that very quickly. Like basically, all these uh, all these uh, concepts and relations that we defined, they need to we can't evaluate them from scratch all the time. Uh, we uh, we use incremental methods for that. Uh, uh, we are friends with uh, Prak McSherry. We love his work, so we use differential data flow in the general case, and then we optimize to special cases. Um, yeah, that's basically what we do, and then I can skip all of this. Um, yeah. Okay, well, I want to do this part in particular, relational machine learning. Um, so currently, if you do machine learning, then essentially what happens is that you might have a beautiful relational schema. You did your very best to not have any redundancy in there. Um, and then you have to run, to go into a, a machine learning tool. These works with, with, uh, with matrices, and to be specific, one matrix. Yeah, so you have to, the entire schema has to be transformed into it. Um, so you need to join it all together. And uh, you get kind of the ultimate denormalization of your entire database schema in that matrix. Yeah? So to show you concretely what that means, you don't have to understand any of this. Yeah? This is briefly going to explain is let's say if you have a sales data set, SKU store dates, you're going to predict how much you're selling. Uh, then you have to join all these properties of all these other uh, of the SKUs and the stores and the leaks into it. And you get this really wide thing uh, with all, all this redundancy. And what you see, for example, is that uh, repeatedly you see that the SKU is. $5.14 dollars um, and so on, yeah? Okay, all right, so the uh, so we have devised methods uh, for implementing um, uh, machine learning in engine itself. Uh, so with our research network, notably, um, we have developed methods that do not create a design matrix and operate directly on the relational structure. Uh, so for that, uh, we needed to invent a bunch of things, like we need to figure out how to write these models generically, and we need to differentiate them, take the derivative of it, and we need to optimize them. Yeah, I want to go to the optimization one. So you probably get the idea from earlier. We're really good at describing generic machine learning models relationally. That's what you see here. Uh, this is the interesting part, is that uh, what happens here is let's say if you let's for a linear regression, a linear regression you typically compute a, co uh, a covariance matrix, um, and uh, that matrix is 
the, 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 you do that as aggregations of the design matrix. But the design matrix has an incredible amount of redundancy, right? Um, so you're doing a lot of unnecessary work, presumably. So what would happen if you wouldn't do that? Um, so uh, here, I gave the rel definition of the design matrix aggregation. Uh, design matrix is, is a generic thing with a feature as an argument, let's say, that's the column that you're dealing with, and then you aggregate them all together. Now, uh, imagine that you specialize that to the price of a SKU and the size of a store. So you can imagine that these J's and these K's are replaced by this, right? And then you immediately see that this is kind of weird because like a, a price of a SKU is completely independent of the store of the day in this data set. So like, why are you multiplying these numbers if they don't matter, right? They're all the same. So our uh, semantic optimizer knows that structure, that understands functional dependencies and actually can compile that into or optimize it into this computation where we take the price only once from the original relational structure and then just multiply it with the counts of the other things. Yeah, so that is again, semantic optimization at work. Okay, all right, papers. Um, I should probably stop soon, right? Um, the, um, um, how am I on time, Andy? Like, like four or five more minutes. Okay, all right, cool, yeah. Uh, all right, then I can do this quickly. So we also uh, do mathematical optimization. Um, I'll briefly explain what it is, if you, uh, maybe you have not seen it in a while. So what I just showed you is unconstrained optimization. So there's an objective function, which is the, uh, the cost function of the, of the model. And then typically you take the derivative of it and you do something like gradient descent and then you find the solution. And what's interesting in particular is that all solutions are acceptable. You just want to find the cheapest one, right? Um, so constraint optimization, mathematical optimization is different in that there's a cost function, but there's also constraints associated with it. And uh, these are there's a completely different complexity class of computation. I find that fascinating. Uh, and uh, so you go to solvers for that, like LP and ILP and that kind of stuff. Yeah, like Gurobi is a well-known one, uh, Cplex and Express and yeah. Now, the way that you code these normally is via APIs or via Ample or something like that. And they're actually beautiful high-level mods. Um, and so I have a couple of examples here. So this is the textbook uh, manufacturing example. Uh, this is the model in Jump, which is a Julia library, which is great. It's a very high level spec of uh, optimization problems. And if you, well, if you look very quickly, you can see that uh, the objective is the maximum of the sum of the profit. Um, and uh, here the same, right? You maximize the profit and it's pretty declarative, right? It's math. Uh, and well, I just showed you a lot of math in RHEL. Like certainly you can write this in RHEL as well, right? Um, so that's exactly what we do. Uh, so RHEL supports expressing these objective functions and constraints. And then um, these actually have to be ground to the data that you're dealing on. And that happens in the database, which is something that is in, uh, the databases are good at that. Um, and then um, we give the, the cost function and the constraints to the solver and the solver will find a solution for us. So it will create a relation. And in this case, it's gonna invent and make relations for us. Yeah? The design of this is very similar to Jump. Uh, so Jump is a great system in Julia and the, the way that we did this is very, very similar. Basically the, this, this code is symbolically evaluated and instead of querying, it creates the, uh, the solver spec, yeah? Um, all right, and the cool thing is that this all happens in the dependency graph. So you can actually input into the optimizer can actually be from your semantic layer. Right, and you can the output of it can also be used in a semantic layer, and it can go into a machine learning problem or something like that. Um, right, so it's really completely integrated in the semantic layer of the system here. All right, SQL. Um, so um, we uh, use DuckDB. So DuckDB, if you don't know it, is an embeddable SQL OLAP system. It's great. It is uh, very high quality. It's fast. Um, it is uh, getting very popular. Um, so we use uh, DuckDB to get SQL support. Um, so what we do is that rel is used to model SQL tables. Uh, because like you probably get it is that a rel relation is not a table. Uh, like a table is a collection of relations. And so you can define those in rel uh, like, like this. And externally that looks like a table. Um, yeah. And so this is the, the mapping that we do. Um, and then we use DuckDB entirely for the query evaluation. And what's kind of cool about this is that because you define it in this way, you can actually compute an individual column, right? So you don't, you're not stuck with, let's say in SQL, you can only do like tables or views, but you can't put one view column in a table. Um, and, but because we actually have decomposed uh, the table in these separate things, we can actually do that. So you can actually compute uh, the columns into, the, into a table that otherwise has data. Um, 
So we did look at some other approaches. I'm happy to talk about our decision process, but I'm running out of time, of course. Um, and uh, we, so Duck, DuckDB is, is in the foundation now, and we are members of that foundation, and we're, uh, we really like working with these guys. Um, I had a recap, um, but I'm really low on time, so let me not spend too much time here. Basically, like you learned about uh, reasoning, immutable databases, uh, we do vectorization, virtual optimal joins, semantic optimization, incrementality, we have a language, RHEL, relational machine learning, mathematical optimization, and SQL. Yeah. Um, so like Andy already asked at the beginning, we have 125 people. It's really cool to see how many different companies they come from. It's really interesting to work with people with so many different experiences. Uh, we have investors. We have uh, Bob Merglia, who is also an investor. I think he's on the call maybe. Um, and, and we have a research network. It's really great. Like we love working with the academic community. And um, uh, we have some great people like Peter Bones and Dan Altiano, Dan Cicero in our network that we work with and we regularly meet with to learn about uh, get advice and work together on research. That's it. I will clap and pass that uh, This is a lot to take in, very fascinating. Um, so I guess we have time for one or two questions from the audience. Uh, Amol, if you want to go first. Um, yeah, I, uh, I kind of share your sentiment there. There's a lot, lot in this, uh, this talk and I have a whole bunch of questions. But let me ask a main one. I think uh, Hung already answered my question in the chat. But I was curious as to how the different pieces here like architecturally fit together. You mentioned Julia for compilation. Then you mentioned DuckDB for querying. Um, and you earlier mentioned uh, vectorized uh, 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 execution. What does the architecture of the system overall look like? Is, is yeah, I should have included. The, the, yeah, I should have included the picture, something like that. But basically, uh, it is uh, like our system is like uh, like beyond ninety five percent Julia. Uh, so it's almost entirely Julia. There are very small pieces are in in, in C or C plus. Julia interfaces with C plus plus really well. Uh, the the DuckDB work, people are working on a Julia library, um, and that is what we use basically. Uh, and uh, so that's also separately available to people who use Julia. Um, of course, DuckDB itself is written in, uh, I guess, C++ actually, no, but I assume it's C++. Uh, but like, we can interface with that perfectly fine. Um, and uh, yeah, that's, that's basically it. Um, so it's a single process. Um, so uh, we have a buffer pool, uh, like buffer pools across processes is not amazing. Um, we have a pager that manages the memory. Um, it is... Uh, um, uh, so yeah, it's a that's the architecture. It's just, uh, we're working on distribution. It's in the lab, um, so that that's ongoing. Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah. Thanks. Can I ask my question? Go for it. Yes, go for it. Yeah. So the, I was wondering that how you partition the data across nodes, and particularly when you your correlated subquery. So every node has to reach the other nodes because you're kind of navigating. So it's an n score problem. Yeah, well, so the, uh, that's a good question. The, uh, like we, we don't have enough experience yet to really know how good our system is gonna perform for some use cases. Like it is true, of course, that uh, graph workloads are challenging to partition and distribute. Uh, there are very specialized systems that do that extraordinarily well. Like let's say there's specialized triangle counting algorithms that distribute really well, right? So we will probably continue to innovate here. Like I'm, I'm gonna go back to Colt and say, we can keep improving the system <laughs> separate from your logic. Uh, but realistically, I do think there will be workloads that will be performing uh, better or worse in an out of course setting. So the, uh, yeah. Um, the correlation is the, like the, the, the correlation is uh, based on the query optimizer choices and it, it can have awareness of this. So I do think we can manage some correlators of queries pretty well, but uh, um, yeah. And because the data is, immu is immutable, you can have multiple copies, right? There's not one node that owns anything or something like that. Yeah. So like you can replicate the data. So if it is only a replication yeah. problem, then that is not an issue. Yeah. So how big is your database here? Is it like a terabyte, 100 terabyte, petabyte? What is that? <laughs> well, it still remains to be seen what we're aiming for, really. I think we're definitely aiming for terabytes. Um, the, uh, 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 the, I have no problem with a petabyte database if there are videos and images in there, uh, which is commonly the case, of course. Uh, like in, in, in principle, in the end, we only care about the data that's actively being used because it's all sitting in a tree and stored and it's indexed. 
Um, so to some degree, the sky is the limit, but uh, I think we still are, we're still early days in scaling up to very large data sets. So we'll have to see uh, what we can handle really. So. Okay, got it. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. My last question is like, again, I think the architecture diagram would be helpful. Are you guys trying to be like the data warehouse of record or are you pulling things from Snowflake or Redshift or like, like how, how yeah. do we think about what it yeah. is? There was one little picture on that that uh, was the the pairing thing. So uh, so we yeah. are uh, not uh, uh, we're trying to complement the warehouses right now, right? Because they are they do a great job at having your data um, and retrieving it. Um, and so we uh, replicate it with CDC into our system, um, and then also go back. Um, the uh, and we are focusing right now on the workloads that they do not support. Uh, exactly. And is there a quick example? What's something you guys can support that logic blocks couldn't support? Um, oh, that's a good question. Yeah. Well, so, so logic blocks was not cloud native in a sense because it was uh, built uh, on, on premise. So it, it couldn't sure. scale out to uh, larger nodes. Um, the, um, we also like really the, the biggest difference is probably the language because like uh, the language is very expressive and general and library stuff and all the kind of stuff. It's a completely different programming experience, really. Um, so the language and the uh, cloud native, the, I would probably say, yeah. Yeah. 